All right, I know Rich has a lot to cover today, so I think I'm gonna get started even though there are still people signing in. Uh, they'll just miss this little um, brief introduction. Uh, today's webinar is being presented by the First Detector Program, a training and outreach program focused on invasive plant pests. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will post the link on the First Detector training site after the event is complete. We hope that you will revisit the content yourself and share the link with friends and family to help spread the word about the importance of early detection as it relates to plant health. We also invite your comments and questions. Uh, we have um, a question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. If you think of a question for Rich at any point, just type it in the question box and we will either pose it to him um, at that time or hold it for discussion at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, let's see. Rich, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready whenever you are. All right. So I'm going to turn it over. I never mentioned I'm Rachel McCarthy, and I've been working on the First Detector Project um, for 10 years now. And um, we have a great lineup. Today is Rich Buckley from Rutgers University, and he's going to be doing um, a general scouting presentation called The Art of the Diagnosis. I think he may have changed that title a little bit and I'm gonna let Rich um, introduce himself. So um, thanks for joining. If you have any technical questions, please use the chat to let, um, let the panelists know. Thanks so much. Great, thanks Rachel. Um, yeah, uh, art, art of the Diagnosis. Uh, uh, I think all of you as, as uh, first detectors have been through some basic plant path training the first module, I think, in the in uh, the online training is is uh, uh, the art of the diagnosis, um, and that that's essentially what we're talking about today. Um, I'm uh, doing a short version of this. It's a talk uh, that I do quite often with master gardeners and and garden club uh, folks in New Jersey. It takes me three hours when I do it with them. We got about 45 minutes, so I'm going to focus on some of the things that you need to know. Uh, to make decisions when you're looking at plants. Now, now before I get started, um, I always like to start all of my presentations with a little bit of fun. And uh, fun for me is uh, the Grateful Dead. And uh, uh, today in Grateful Dead history is, is uh, uh, something I like to talk about. And uh, hopefully you're all not rolling your eyes, but uh, June was a fertile month in Grateful Dead concert history. And, and June 24th, has about 10 different dates of concerts that uh, uh, you, can, you can listen to. If you go onto the archive.org, you can call up the date and listen to the show. I recommend the show from 624, 1976 from the Tower Theater in Philadelphia. Uh, it was a radio broadcast on WMMR FM uh, out of Philadelphia. And uh, it's a really good show. And uh, I've been to the Tower Theater many times. Uh, I think you'll like it. Uh, if you're a fan of the Grateful Dead, um, I highly recommend it at, at any rate. Um, moving right into this, um, I'm, my name's Rich Buckley and, I, and I'm the diagnostician at Rutgers University's Plant Diagnostic Lab. And I'm a professional plant pathologist that has been in my position uh, since 1991. And since that time, I've looked at about 65,000 plants for disease and insect pest diagnosis. And being from New Jersey, we look at turf grass and ornamental plants. Um, golf turf is my specialty. Um, I'm not gonna talk about much of that in here today, but I looked at about 25,000 samples from golf courses around the country, um, arguably more than any other person in the world. Um, I get to look at tiny little grass plants. Um, our second biggest group of clients are uh, uh, arborists, nursery and lawn and landscape uh, professionals. Uh, and so we're kind of focusing here on, on ornamental plants as opposed to field crops and, and fruit, fruit trees. Now, you know, I'm a pathologist. So if you look at this slide down at the bottom, uh, I'm a specialist in the structural and function, functional changes caused by disease. Now, you know, that, that means a lot of things uh, to a lot of different people. There's people who study all aspects of, of what we might call the disease cycle, um, you know, from a whole plant level all the way down to the molecular processes that, and the interactions between organisms and the plants they attack. So, so it's, a, it's, it's a complex multidisciplinary field 
There's a lot of different specialties within it. Um, my specialty is looking at whole plants and going, hey, what, how come that, that branch is dead, right? And so when I talk about this in, in those terms, I think the best definition of pathology for us is a person or the process where we recognize the deviation from the normal condition of a plant, right? And so what we're trying to do is make judgments based on that deviation. Now, before we get going and, and talk about things like symptoms, you know, plant diseases are pretty complex relationships between, you know, multiple different factors. Uh, you know, uh, we need a susceptible host plant in order for disease to occur, a plant that's in a condition in that, that it can become uh, infected or invaded by a, by a pathogen or disease-causing agent. That disease-causing agent, pathogen or insect, uh, fungus, bacteria, virus, uh, has to be active and has to be growing and has to have uh, the efficiency and the energy to invade the host plant and, and use it as a food source and, and a, a, a launching site to, to move to other plants. And this relationship between these living organisms has to occur within a set of favorable environmental conditions. And you know, it, it's a complex thing, but it's easy, it's easy to uh, illustrate using the, the disease triangle model, this graphic um, that, that uh, we use uh, to describe you know, uh, plant, plant problems. Um, interestingly enough, you know, uh, uh, th th this, this uh, model, as simple as it is, um, it is relatively new in history of, of, of plants. You know, we, we developed it, or Anton de Berry in the, in the, in the, in the 1860s, uh, uh, solving the Irish potato famine, you know, put together the model, and, and it's something that we've, we've carried forward into today. But the remarkable thing to me is that everything we know about infectious disease, we learned in the last 150 years or so. And uh, 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 that, that, that's a remarkable step forward for mankind. Now, when we talk about uh, pathogens or disease-causing agents, we have living organisms that grow, multiply, and spread from plant to plant. So uh, when you're looking at this, we, you know, again, we call them pathogens, we call it infectious disease. Um, only about 10% of the plant problems reported are caused by living organisms. It's kind of interesting to me um, because most of us think that it's, it, that number's a lot higher. Um, we also have uh, what we call abiotic or non-infectious disease. I prefer the term injury uh, as opposed to disease. I think disease implies the triangle model and this, uh, these environmental conditions that impact plant development or, or impact our, the, the normal development of a plant um, are, might be only one side of the triangle, you know, the environmental part of the triangle. Um, while they can drive the relationship between living organisms, um, they also can kill and damage plants outright. And 90% of plant problems reported um, are caused by injuries, not disease. And again, you know, these numbers seem, seem out of whack a little bit. Um, I got them from a textbook uh, called Introduction plant, to Plant Pathology by a guy named George Agrios. And uh, when I look at my own data in my lab, my number of abiotic is 45%. And you know, it's clearly not 90%. But the reason my number is skewed down is because I work with a pretty highly sophisticated group of, of plant managers that bring us stuff that are outright diseases. They just need to know which one it is, right? So, so the, the, the first lesson here, I think, is when you're looking at a plant problem, you know, the, the, the first step or one, one of the first things you need to uh, separate here is, is this an abiotic stress? Or, or living organism that's causing the problem. And I would think abiotic stress first and then work your way down toward the pathogens and pests that might be, be uh, uh, affecting your plant. Um, living organisms, uh, the pathogens, you know, to, a, to an outright pathologist, um, we're talking about fungi, bacteria, viruses, uh, molecules, um, uh, you know, protozoa, uh, uh, algae, of course, uh, uh, the pythiums and phytophthors and downy mildews are now classified as algae. Um, and, and, and 
you know, it, it, that's nice. Um, but as a diagnostician or as a plant manager, we also have to include things like insects and mites as, as pathogens because they cause the same types of symptoms or the same types of problems in plants. Um, and, you know, when, when, when someone's bringing you an unknown, it could be an insect, it could be a, a, a disease agent. Um, so we have to consider them as, as pathogens. The other point I would make here is that, uh, uh, you know, insects and mites follow the, the disease triangle model re really, really well. You know, they, they fit into that triangle really nicely. And so some, some uh, uh, insect or entomology training is essential if you want to become a good diagnostician or good plant manager. So we can't forget them. Now, one more before we uh, start talking about the symptoms and maybe get pushed toward the meat of the talk. Um, we can't forget abiotic causal agents, right? Now, I like to call them physiogens in honor of a, a professor I had, uh, Dr. David Lewis. Um, uh, he, uh, he taught me in the late 80s. And when I started my job, I would ask for help sometimes and he'd look at me and whenever he didn't know what, what the cause of the problem was, he'd say it was an unknown physiogenic disorder. And uh, so to this day, I still use that term, that terminology. But physiogen gives you just a, a contrasting term to pathogen. So, so again, it's a little my own idiosyncrasy here, but we divide these things up into physical, chemical, and mechanical factors. And you see the tree in the photograph. And it's a perfect picture from the Rutgers campus because uh, one, whose idea was to plant a tree in the parking lot? But because they put a tree in the parking lot, we have problems with uh, moisture stress. You know, the, there's a drainage or a drought issue. Um, there's a heat sink, everything dripping out of those cars, uh, uh, all the de-icing materials all go down into that hole. You know, if you go to any uh, local supermarket, you're gonna see all the uh, shopping carts piled up on top of that tree. If it snows, the snow goes there. So those trees and parking lots get battered by everything on the list, you know? And, and uh, uh, if you think that tree, you know, if your expectation for that tree is that it's gonna make it to its final uh, mature height and size, um, you know, that, that in my world is an unrealistic expectation. Uh, uh, but, but, but again, you know, we, we have all of these factors that affect plants. We also want to recognize that these factors can impact the disease triangle by making the plant weak enough to be disease, become diseased or attacked by an insect, right? Or by helping to turn on a pathogen so that it can do its job, uh, it, it, you know, as, 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 a, as a parasite or in infecting your particular plant. So these environmental conditions, how you like this slide? I, I, I'm cracking myself up looking at it. I still use it, um, the disease triangle slide too. Uh, uh, we made them in 1991 using a graphics program called Harvard's Gra Harvard Graphics. And we we're so proud of it, um, you know, 30 years later, it's still in the talk. Um, but uh, it's definitely primitive in, in its presentation, but it gets the job done, right? So this environmental condition can kill the plant outright, an abiotic stress factor. It also impacts the, the condition of the host plant. Uh, it will help make it susceptible or resistant, right? If we have proper uh, conditions for growth, the plant's gonna be healthy, it's gonna fight off attack, right? If we have something that has a negative impact on the host, it's gonna be weaker, it's gonna have a harder time uh, uh, dealing with the pathogens and insects that, that come, come and interact with it. And, and so it, it's susceptible. And at the same time, this environmental condition is turning th these pathogens on and off. When we talk about fungi, for instance, water is the on and off switch. So if we have enough moisture in the system, fungi will turn on. All these pathogens also generally have a temperature range and where, where they are most active. And we think about that as the throttle, right? The closer you get to the right temperature, the faster the fungus is gonna grow, right? So, so we have this idea where we have something negative for the host, positive for the pathogen, we get disease outbreak, right? And, and, and this is the important thing um, uh, in, in pest management, right? If you can control the environment, you can control the disease outbreak, you know, to a certain degree. In some systems like greenhouses, it works really well. 
Um, it, it, it's also important from a diagnostic standpoint, because if you look at the disease, you need to ask yourself, not only what is this disease, what caused it, but why did it happen? And you can back up toward those environmental factors, the things that we call predisposing conditions, and get an idea of, of what turned on the problem, right? And maybe you can mitigate the problem going forward from that point. So, so real important, recognize the triangle here in, in the slide and uh, uh, how the environment drive, drives, drives it forward. All right, next thing. How do you know when your plant is dead, right? So, so uh, uh, we have two things, um, symptoms and signs. And so uh, symptoms are of observable conditions of abnormal physiology in the plant, right? That, that we're looking at the plant. What's going wrong? Are you recognizing the deviation from normal? Signs are the physical presence of the causal agent or clear evidence of abiotic stress, right? So, so uh, 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 we, we like to include the, you know, well, it was 100 degrees today and my, my grass is brown as a sign as well, you know, uh, as well as looking for fruiting bodies and that sort of thing. So, so symptom descriptions are esoteric. Um, you can see that there's a lot of terminology here that uh, I don't even know what it means, but I, I found them in a, in a plant path textbook and wrote them down to make this list, right? So, so uh, uh, the, the, the point I think here is, regardless of your sophistication with the terminology, Remember when you're describing a symptom, you're describing the plant. So, so if it's got spots, it must be a leaf spot. The leaves fall off as defoliation. And we can start to use these symptom descriptions to make decisions, right? So you start adding them up. And with this disease, aster yellows, you can see the healthy one uh, uh, in, in the slide to the right. Right next to it is a yellow one. That's chlorotic. It's stunted. Um, the, the proliferation of shoots is called witch's broom. And then if you look at the, at the flower on the left, you know, the, the lack of color and the abnormal growth is called fillity. And you add symptom A, symptom B, symptom C, symptom D together, and it points you toward a type of a problem, right? And this is, this is a good way of using symptoms, right? We, we, we start to narrow down our focus and point toward a cause, right? And the, the issue, though, is that you have to be careful about that. You can't just jump to conclusions you know, recognizing the symptoms is the beginning of the investigation. You need a lot more information to make a smart decision, right? So we want, we want to, you know, if I showed a picture of a wilted uh, fuchsia uh, and said, what's the cause? We could come up with 10 causes why a fuchsia would wilt. So you got to be very careful about, about uh, making assumptions just based on symptoms. But again, it's the start of the show. What we want to try to do is get to the sign. So the signs are the fungal fruiting bodies. And you know, with this list of, of terminology over here is basically screaming at you, with the exception of a couple of insect things, mushroom, you know, mushroom, fruiting body. So we need to see the reproductive structures. We need to see the signs. We can work with some vegetative characteristics, the mycelia, um, and, and, and you know, make, make, make identifications that way. You know, sometimes it takes sophistication and tools to do that, but there's some things that you can do in the field like cedar apple rust. You know, uh, no other fungus looks quite like this. Um, you can see it. Uh, 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 you could say that's gymnosporangium. Um, and, and you're right, right? Uh, uh, the problem with signs generally is that they're harder to see, right? So this is a picture of dogwood uh, anthracnose that causes twig dieback and, and small cankers. And, and you get down in there close and you see just a bunch of little black dots. Now this is a powerful tool, you know it's fungus now, you know, uh, because they're there, but is it the fungus that caused the damage or is it a fungus that came on top of something that died from heat or drought? You know, we don't know that. I need to get that under a microscope to see what fruiting body that is, to look at the spores, to use a dichotomous key uh, and, and to identify it, right? So. Uh, uh, Again, it, it's a little bit more difficult uh, in most cases, but there is some power in noticing and recognizing that there are fungal fruiting bodies associated with your plant damage. You know, again, it helps narrow down possibilities. So, so here's the thing. There's some fungi, and I alluded to it just then, that I call imposters. They get on plant tissue that's dead and dying. So just because they're there, 
doesn't mean they're the problem. You can't spray them away. You know, we might have something from a horticultural standpoint, that's the issue. You know, we need more information to make a smart choice. But again, we have these visual cues, symptoms and signs. And if we add them to the greater uh, predominance of circumstances, we can come up with a pretty good diagnosis uh, most of the time. So that being said, about 15 or 20 minutes into this, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through basic diagnostics, right? Um, and, and I'm gonna go quick. We're, we're, we're gonna talk about uh, 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 symptoms mostly here, but there's a couple other points I wanna make. So, so you're a plant manager and you're looking, you know, whether it's your own garden or uh, uh, you're working in a nursery or whatever, someone hands you something that's dead and well, what caused this? So the first thing we need to do is identify the plant. This is an important piece of information because of the abiotic causes, right? If we are trying to figure out what's wrong with the plant, we need to understand what's supposed to go right. What are the horticultural requirements for this plant, right? What's supposed to go right? And my, the, the, the example I always use here in New Jersey is, you know, uh, where do you think Colorado blue spruce wants to live? Right, and, and everybody looks at me and I'm like, you know, and then I say, it, it ain't Tom's River, you know? And, and so trees on, co on the coast in New Jersey and sandy soils are gonna perform worse than in their na native habitat. And, and so, so when it's hot, you know, it's probably the cause. Now, the other thing that we're thinking about with plant identity is, once you know what plant you have, you get a list of pathogens and insect pests that cause damage to that particular plant, right? Not all plants get all diseases, not all diseases get on all plants. Now the first detector program is focusing on invasives and significant pests and unusual things, right? Things that we don't want in the country or we're monitoring the movement of, right? Now that being said, most of the stuff that we see follow this IPM uh, 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 concept called the key plant key pest concept and to me when I talk about that I say this is your main plant and this is your main pest every plant has a main problem right or two and so most of what we see in my lab are the main problems of this stuff and, and so focus on the abiotic stress first and then what is the main problem for this particular plant and and you're going to solve the problem you know, 80% of the time at that point. You know, you, you may be the first one ever with one of these uh, uh, diseases that you're gonna hear about in, in subsequent uh, presentations, but uh, uh, more likely you're gonna see something that's common to your area and common to that particular plant, right? So, so another way of, uh, of, of narrowing down possibilities. And here's just an example of that. These are, these are uh, arborvitaes. Um, I'm, I'm sure if, if you know me, you've heard me say I hate arborvitaes. Um, I really, I get them in my lab every day. It, uh, they fail for a lot of reasons. In 2010 in New Jersey, we had, we had more than 20 days over 90 degrees and seven days over 100 degrees. And, and in, in that time period, we started to recognize that arborvitaes were cooked all over the place. You know, and, and, and you know, it, was, it took me a little bit of time to figure, figure out the cause and effect. You know, we not only saw that, that we had arborvitae, we had junipers, we had camisipris, we had Leyland cypress, you know, they all were browning. And, and I asked, you know, you ask yourself, why are all these plants failing this summer? And you go back to the center of origin and the plant family, and you find that the Cupressiaceae, the center of origin is in the mountains of China. And so what's the difference between the weather in mountainous areas in China and in Tom's River, New Jersey, when it's 100 degrees? So of course they're cooking in the heat. You know, they like a cooler, moister environment, right? So, so just no one plant would tell you the problem. There's a boxwood. Now, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna hate, hate boxwood too. Um, uh, until we had boxwood blight, you know, the key pest for boxwood is a fungus called Pseudonectria, um, which we uh, uh, call Viatella or Viatella stem blight. Um, I have literally 900 boxwood entries in my database and almost every letter, uh, 850 of them, say Vallutella somewhere in the letter. You know, Vallutella because it's hot, Vallutella because you water too much, Vallutella because it's a transplant, but it's the key problem. It's the, it's, it, it is, in my world, 
the main or the key pest for, for boxwood, it's the first thing we want to rule out before we move on to something else, right? So, so again, that this idea of key pests based on plant associations is really important to you. Next thing to do is to find the problem. So what we're trying to do is, again, narrow down, separate abiotic versus biotic here, right? So, so we're going to go through this, evaluate the entire plant, right? Identify the dysfunctional plant part or system. Spectacular abnormalities in the canopy sometimes have nothing to do with the canopy and everything to do with the roots. But how are you going to know unless you're willing to yank the plant out of the ground? In this particular example, you know, it took us about 90 seconds to identify the problem. We pulled it out of the pot, knocked the pot soil off, and there's the peach tree borers, right? Unless you're willing to do that, you're never going to see the, 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 the issue. You know, another thing here is, you know, uh, everybody's kind of emotionally attached to their plant material. Nobody wants to cut it up. You know, you just kind of wish that branch would turn green, you know, uh, but what you need to do is, is take your knife out and cut, cut up, sacrifice one for the good of the many, yank it out, cut a branch off, that sort of thing and investigate. If you can define the problem based on symptom expression, Right, so, so in this example, you see the bark's cut away and there's discoloration in the cambium, we call that a canker, then you can narrow down. You know, there's a book called Westcott's Plant Disease Handbook. You can look up the plant and see the different types of, of uh, organisms listed based on symptom expression. So you, again, you're narrowing down possibilities. So you define the problem as a canker and you, and, and you look in the literature and now you have three fungi to pick from instead of 50, right? So, so again, you know, specific pathogens attack specific plant parts. It's a great way to narrow down focus. Don't be afraid to cut stuff up. Look at the plant community, right? Every plant, uh, each plant family has similar problems. And, and so, so here's a picture of what uh, passes for an attractive landscape on a corporate site in New Jersey. We have all the obligate plants here, the grasses, the euonymus, the pear, the blue spruce, and if you see a symptom that covers the whole landscape, every plant, it's not likely to be uh, a, a disease agent. Uh, you know, looking at this picture and the fact that there's no weeds in the turf, it maybe it was drift from the guy who sprayed the herbicide on, those, on that turf grass area that damaged all the plants. But if you look at a landscape and it's closely related plants, all the ericaceae, you know, the rhododendron and the azalea, you know, and the blueberry or whatever, um, then it's more likely right, to be a living organism, right? So, so this is a good tool, you know, what else is affected in the landscape? And if it's closely related plants, then start thinking living. If it's everything, then well, maybe it was 100 degrees on Thursday, you know? So, so the, the, these, these things will help you narrow down. Um, you know, a, a tool I like, you know, not, not only when we're looking at a, an individual site, you know, one of the things that helps me a lot with this concept is, uh, it's just paying attention to stuff on, on, on my daily travels. You know, uh, uh, that's sort of the curse of, of being a pathologist, you know, in the, in the role that I have is every time I go outside, I'm at work, right? So everywhere I look, you know, like don't invite me to a picnic at your house and ask me how your garden looks because you'll be upset with my answer probably because <laughs> I'm going to see all the problems, right? So if you're, if you're, if you're mindful of the things you're looking at, you know, you're going to see them in your own landscapes or in your own nurseries or on your own managed sites, um, uh, uh, just, just the same as you saw them on your trip to the grocery store. So again, you know, plant community is important. Individual plants, individual plant parts are all important things to think about. Look for patterns. Relate to environmental site and cultural inputs, right? So, so uniformity usually means an abiotic stress. Randomness usually means a living organism, right? So think about this, right? So uh, um, this is what we call drop spread or disease. You know, this is the client that went to the big box store and got the spreader and it's a drop spreader and it says, put the, set, set it on four. He puts the bag of fertilizer in, sets it on four and stripes the lawn, right? Uh, there's an application pattern. It's clearly an abiotic stress, right? Uh, you, you look at something like this, Christmas tree grower with Swiss needle cast and note that the brown trees are randomly distributed in that in that stand of trees. Um, 
these trees in New Jersey, you know, we have a disease called rab decline needle cast. And one of the ways that we uh, manage that in Christmas tree production is to use seed sources or, or, or seedlings that come from Northern Rocky Mountain locations, you know, shoe swaps or whatever we call them. And, and uh, cause their, their origin is, is national forests in, in British Columbia. And those trees break bud late, right? And so in a choose and cut, they replace the trees randomly. They're using shoe swaps cause they had rab decline last year. And shoe swaps break bud late and they break bud after rab decline comes. So they don't get that disease, but they break bud into Theocryptus when it were, or the Swiss needle cast. So, so they get that, that, you know, so the needle cast gets you coming and going, but again, it's, it's just random uh, among trees that are in the susceptible condition when the fungus blows by. Right. So, so again, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's random versus uniform. Right. And, and so, so that's going to help us with the, again, abiotic versus biotic. One more, one more point here. Look for symptom progression. Disease implies a life cycle, right? So life cycles take time, right? Sudden death or decline is generally related to an abiotic stress. So, so right, so we're thinking about progressive being living, non-progressive being abiotic, or infectious, biotic, non-infectious, abiotic. And so here's a, here's a picture of Phytophthora crown and root rot. And we had inoculated these and we were doing fungicide trials on, on these 360 of them. And this was the rating system, five for healthy, one on the right for, for disease. It took about four to six weeks to go from five to one, right? You know, five, four, three, two, one to healthy. So you think about your plant declining over time. You know, you also, if you start on the right at the dead one and think of this as a foundation planting and the one on the end died, and then it spread to the one next to it, and then it spread to the one next to it, you know? So if you can recognize this time frame, you know, the movement uh, over a period of time, and look, we got diseases where the time frame is 10 years, and we got diseases where the time frame is, is, is you know, 10 hours, right? But if you can recognize that, you can lean toward a disease, right? And so you compare it to something like this. This, this, this was a, a, a site I went to, um, they were spraying for broadleaf weed control and someone on the crew poured a gallon of glyphosate into the tank. And so they sprayed 10 acres with glyphosate. Um, interestingly enough, they were kind of mad at me when I got on the site and said, said, didn't look like you got good coverage. Um, <laughs> nobody was happy about that. Um, but, but the point here is that once it was sprayed, it's just a, a matter of days before the, the whole area declines in a pattern that relates to the application, right? You know, it, it never gets any better, uh, doesn't spread. You know, you can see the green grass is, is, is still green where it wasn't sprayed. And, and, and so, so it's, it's, a, it's a rapid, it's a rapid one time cause and effect, right? Versus a time period that may be days, weeks, or months, right? So if you, again, if you can recognize this, you can separate biotic versus abiotic. All right, here we go. Um, guys, okay? I know I can't see, see the room, um, but, uh, uh, and I know I'm going fast, but I live in New Jersey and you have to talk fast if you live in New Jersey. Um, we're gonna move here to this idea of classic symptoms, right? So I'm gonna slow down a little bit uh, uh, to get through this. Clearly. So the question you got to ask yourself is, if I've decided this is a living organism, you know, what are the typical symptoms I'm going to see for each of the different causes, fungus, bacteria, virus, insect, right? And then if I decide it's an abiotic stress factor, what are the typical symptoms I would see from each one of them, right? So, so what you're looking at is, is a fungus called pythium, right? And, and, and I call it a fungus um, because mycologists study these things, even though they aren't in the kingdom of fungi, right? So it's the best picture I had of mycelia on the left. And we, we, we made a slide of that, that cottony mass. And on the right, you see hyphae. Now the round things are reproductive structures. So, so here's the point I wanna make with this. You know, fungi, when they attack a plant, they attack through a central infection point through a germ tube. 
It's likely that a spore blew in the wind or something, landed on the plant, germinated into a germ tube. The germ tube pushes itself down through in between the cells and it soaks up the nutrients that are moving in between the cells in the plant. Rarely breaks down cell walls and that sort of thing. Fungi from that central infection point grow in concentric circles, right? So fungi cause most plant diseases. They attack all possible plant parts and there's a central infection point, grows in concentric circles. So you got a nice round, even border, right? We often see discolorations because of the nature of the pathogenesis, the way the fungus is between the cells, it's a dry rot and fungi make signs, right? Fungi make signs. So here's an example of a leaf spot, nice and round, papery, dry, papery, thin and dry, you know, nice discolored border to it, you know, attacks a single plant part, you know, this fungus is not gonna rot the whole leaf and move into the stem, you know, uh, 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 perfect example of, uh, of a fungal leaf disease. Here's another example, uh, crown and root rot by, caused by uh, uh, Phytophthora. And your eyes are drawn in this picture to the left down to the base because it's a jerry and it's bleeding a little bit. But that's not wet and water soaked, that's just sap because that's what jerrys do, right? You cut the bark away and you see a nice and even lesion, you know, nice and even, chocolatey brown discoloration, it's a dry rot, attacks a, a specific, specific plant part, you know, the crown. And so, you know, you, you look up cherry, define the problem as a crown rot, and you have one choice, Phytophthora. You know, you're at the answer. So, so again, classic fungal, dry rot, round, dry, you know, uh, discolored. Here's an example of, uh, of an anthracnose disease. And note that it's not particularly round. You know, these are angular spots, but they're dry, right? There's a nice distinct border on them. And if you put that leaf in a plastic bag with a wet paper towel, overnight the fruiting bodies will form on the bottoms of the leaves on the veins. And so there's the point, there's the fruiting bodies, right? So even if you can't identify what that fungus is, you can still say this leaf has all the characteristics of a fungal leaf disease. There's a fungal fruiting body on the bottom. This is a fungal disease. And you're, and you're, you're narrowing down to a couple of choices. You go into a, a textbook, uh, uh, you know, the Cornell book, Diseases of Trees and Shrubs, and you look up maple at, at leaf spot, and you might see a picture that looks exactly like this, you know, and so, so you're right there, 85% confidence that, that you've got the right diagnosis. This is a bacteria, right, moving right along. Bacteria are single-celled organisms. They're really simple. They divide about every 20 minutes. Bacteria make toxins and enzymes within a sugar polysaccharide matrix. You know, they live in colonies. And, and, and so they get into plants through natural openings or wounds, right? Most of the bacterial diseases that I see are in herbaceous plant material. You know, uh, I, this is where we get into the farmers and, and bacterial canker and tomatoes and, and black rot and cabbage and that sort of stuff. Um, gets in through the natural openings. Uh, uh, the, the bacteria makes its toxins and kills and lyses the cells. It's easier to rot the cells between the veins than it is to rot the veins. And so you could get angular spots with a chlorotic halo and it, spots are water soaked as opposed to being dry. Um, these things also will rot the whole plant and turn it to slime. So this is a heuchera. And you can see that it's wet and water soaked. Notice that there's a yellow halo instead of a distinct margin, right? You hold this up to the light and you can see that it's kind of translucent. The cell walls are breaking down. Um, you know, this, if you let it go, will turn to slime. You know, if the conditions are right, uh, 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 it, it continually gets worse where your fungi are gonna be what they are. They're not generally gonna get worse. Um, so, so, so again, it's a, there's, a, there's a distinct contrast here, you know, in a leaf spot. You know, here's a, here's a atypical bacteria, something we see a ton of in New Jersey, but the bacteria survives in the plants, uh, Arwenia, that causes fire blight. Um, in the spring, it oozes out of the lenticels. That sugar slime is attractive to pollinators. They come get a little bit to eat. They get bacterial cells on their body. They go do their job as a pollinator, infect the nectar cells. 
and then we get what we call spur blight. You know, all the flowers and 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 such uh, start to die back. If we have a long, cool spring, the disease continues to progress until we get branch blight, branch, branch dieback, right? So, you know, uh, that's part of the the the, the deal with with, uh, with with bacteria. They continually get worse as long as the condition allows them. With fungi, they kind of stop. The temperature changes, it stops growing, you know, a leaf spot's a leaf spot, a crown rot's a crown rot. So again, a little bit more contrast there. But 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 again, we're we're talking about you know dry and round, angular and wet. Um, uh, the other thing I'll tell you about bacteria is if if they, they kill something herbaceous, um, it stinks. <laughs> so uh, fungi aren't gonna give you that same kind of smell. Sometimes we can see signs with bacteria. Occasionally, we can see bacterial streaming, you know, uh, uh, bacterial wilt of cucumbers. So you get, get the ooze right out of the xylem, you know, that sort of thing, um, but not readily. So you put these into a plastic bag with a wet paper towel, anticipating a fruiting body. What you're going to get is a stinking, messy, messy, slimy plant, as opposed to a, 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 a whole leaf with a fungal fruiting body on the bottom. Viruses, viruses, viruses. That's tobacco mosaic virus, flexus rod. Uh, electron micrograph, um, you know, I think we're all really well versed in virology right now. Um, but what vir viruses do is they commandeer the metabolic processes in a host cell and turn them into factories to make copies of it, right? And so while your plant cell is making copies of tobacco mosaic virus, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's not dividing properly. It's not making chlorophyll. You know, it, it, it's asleep at the wheel. And so you're gonna see a growth response in the plant at that, at that, that relates to the failure of cells to do their job. Now there's a couple of complications. Sometimes virus symptoms are latent. It takes a little while for the symptoms to show up. We have symptomless hosts. I think again, you're all familiar with this terminology and viruses need a method of transmission. You know, we can't just cough. Plants don't cough, um, they have help. And usually it's with an insect with a, that has a piercing sucking mouth part or thrips or something like that, that move viruses from one plant to another. So here's cucumber mosaic, makes nice round rings. So pepper, um, you know, you can eat that pepper, it's no big deal. Um, uh, you're never gonna get a fruiting body. It's never gonna turn to slime. It just is what it is, it's a growth response. You know, it's a color response. It's, 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 a, uh, it's, a, it's a, abnormal, clearly. Um, but, but uh, 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 you know, it, 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 it's got a different characteristic than, the, than the, uh, what a bacteria might. Um, here's hosta, hosta virus X in hosta. And everybody looks at that and goes, oh, I want one of them, man. Look at that. that that's a, uh, it's got a nice, nice color break on it. Um, there was named varieties of hosta with, with hosta virus X at one point. Um, but uh, you can see that the symptom of modeling. You know, it's, it's an abnormal color, plants doing okay. It might die prematurely or die from other stresses. Virus might not kill it. Here's impatient necrotic spot on a hosta. Just to show you the variability in symptom expressions from two different viruses on the same plant. Right, you see the rings here. Now, if you look at impatient necrotic spot on other plants, you find that every plant that gets it has a unique symptom you know, or, or, or something that's unique to that particular plant. So, so here's the thing about viruses, right? Four different viruses can cause the same symptom on a plant, you know, or every different virus can cause a different symptom on every different plant. So it's really difficult to look at a plant, you know, I can't look at that and go, it's impatient necrotic spot, because it might be cucumber mosaic virus, right? So, so, you know, you can tell that, that it's dysfunctional, you know, you can tell that there's a symptom there, but naming the virus is a difficult thing. We need an antibody-based test kit or something like that to, to, name, to name the viruses. Another hint with viruses is that, that uh, uh, we need some uh, uh, vectors. You know, Western flower thrips uh, uh, transmits or, or, or moves uh, impatience across spot from plant to plant. So you've got a funky looking plant and a lot of aphids or a lot of thrips, you know, then it, it increases your confidence level saying that this is a virus. All right, insects. Insects with piercing sucking mouth parts comes first, right? So uh, note that this insect four-line plant bug has a stylet. And when insects feed with a stylet, 
they cause a symptom called stipple. And stipple, you know, will discolor the foliage or distort the growth. You know, occasionally you get a little defoliation or branch die back. Insects that suck plant sap make signs. And we'll come back to that, right? So here's the, your four line plant bug. And I use the example because the stipple was big. It jams that, that stylet in to plant cells. Some of these insects have, uh, you know, they regurgitate uh, enzymes to help them put the stylet in. You may see some yellow spots. You may see some just brown spots. You get a lot of spots. You may see some uh, dis distorted foliage, right? But, but, but again, you know, uh, uh, that's all it does, stipple. Now here's another example. You know, I'm riding my bicycle. I saw this tree and I stopped and it, there's no color. You know, uh, uh, these are smaller feeding wounds and you take this leaf and I turned it over and on the bottom I found a whole bunch of fecal matter. And that fecal matter is typical of lace bugs, right? So one of the things that you can use here, you know, as a sign is the fecal matter made by the insects. So some of them make wax, some of them make wool, you know, some of them make honeydew, some of them make uh, oily fecal matter. If you can recognize the scat, then you can bring it back to the insect, right? So, so again, you know, we have this, this piercing sucking mouth part, you know, we have their waste product as a symptom or a sign. And, uh, uh, you know, that was a million insects in four minutes or less. Um, insects with chewing mouth parts, right? So that's, that's, you know, that's what we're looking at here. It sucking versus chewing. And when we have chewing mouth parts, we eat everything in sight. We do it in a specialized way or we make nests, right? And so, so here we go. You know, uh, uh, gregarious larvae, they chew everything in sight. Everyone knows gypsy moths, you know, uh, oak worms, some of these soft flies, we eat everything in sight. We have insects that make a, a symptom called skeletonization, right? You can see how the tissues chewed between the leaves or between the veins. You know, in New Jersey, if I saw skeletonized leaves on a random plant, I think it was a Japanese beetle. Now that being said, you know, there's, there's specific insect plant interactions where you see skeletonization, you know, elm leaf beetles or imported willow leaf beetles on a willow, you know, but again, that goes back to your plant associations, what skeletonizer gets on this plant and, and the feeding behavior will tell you what it is. Weevils, weevils chew notches and leaves. You know, whether it's a tenth of an inch tall annual bluegrass plant from a putting green or a rhododendron with notches on the leaves, odds are high that it's a weevil that did it, right? So, so again, the feeding behavior and the breeding behavior of these insects will tell you what insect family it is and you go, what weevil gets on this plant? And then you'll, you'll have a list when you look up the plant. Fall webworm makes nests, cover the entire branch. Right, so again, we have tent caterpillars, we got webworms, that sort of thing. We have bagworms, they use plant parts to make a bag, they live in the bag. You know, everybody, hopefully everybody knows what bagworms are. We have insects that use the plant as their nest. You know, they don't construct one. You know, uh, uh, leaf miners, we're having a huge, huge thing with leaf miners this year in New Jersey. You know, these boxwood leaf miners, they lay eggs and the larvae live their, their life cycle uh, it, within the tissues and, it, it, you know, in the spring, they chew a little window and they pupate and they burst out through the window and, and, and then you have uh, uh, the, 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 these flies that, that per perpetuate the life cycle. You know, borers, when we're talking about borers, we're looking at where are the galleries, what are the entrance and exit holes look, at, look like, you know, is there waste product frass in the, in the tunnels or not? You know, and all of these things relate to feeding and breeding, but they're specific to insect families. And if you can recognize that relationship and then go back to your plant association, you'll be pretty close to the cause when, when, when you get to the end of that. Deep breath. I know I'm running long, but we'll, we're, we're, we'll, uh, we got about 10 minutes, so we'll, we'll get there. Typical symptoms of physical injury. T tip and head scorch. Um, uh, uh, outside, down, uh, outside, top down. Um, all right, so look, when stuff, stuff is, 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 is damaged by moisture stress, right? Right, drought or too much water, heat and drought, cold and drought, cold and dry, you, you know, they're inexplicably connected, the, the heat stress and 
or you know temperature and moisture but what you're going to see is a plant that wilts right and if it wilts long enough right if the water deficit the the uh, uh is prolonged you're going to get scorch of the outer tissues right so the scorch is generally going to be uniform it's going to be on all the plants in the same general area on the same type of a root zone you know something like a dogwood scorch is easier than the oak in the background of the picture there you know so so again it's it's a a a, a, a deficit between water going in and out or a, a discrepancy between in and out and the cells that are last in line die first subacute levels of of moisture stress um and again when i say moisture stress think about cause you could have a dead root zone you know a dead root it's not picking up moisture, you know? It doesn't have to just be drought, but the symptom is the same, right? So subacute levels, you'll get pre premature defoliation here on the Doug firs, it's dropping interior needles. In New Jersey, if, if we get heat and drought on an ash, the leaves will turn yellow and drop in August, you know? So, so we might see a little bit of that in a subacute level. In a more severe level, you're gonna see that the plants die from the outside in and the top down. And I think you can see in both examples here how it's tip and scorch of the entire plant, right? So you wanna think in those kinds of terms of the pattern of damage, right? So what about chemical injury? Chemical injury looks a lot like physical or, or a physical because some chemicals are taken up and moved out to the edges and burn and kill the tips and the edges, right? But we also have chemicals that burn based on contact. And we also have materials that affect growth, right? So just kind of quickly, like this is a horticultural oil applied on a cloudy day. It burnt this uh, spruce by contact, right? Contact injury. You know, uh, uh, here we have a material called Imprellus. They used it on grass for broadleaf weed control. It was too water soluble. All the plants took it up and moved it out to the tips. High concentrations cause the tips and the edge to burn. So there's like your general theme, contact versus uptake. Now, if you look at this picture, you note that there's a growth response. Now, an herbicide called dicamba, you know, that we use, you know, these were mine, I admit it. I was, I was zipping some plantain, you know, with a hose end sprayer and it drifted onto my hydrangeas and, and it upward cupped the leaves. Right, it's an auxin mimic, so it causes the cells to divide at different rates and you get this abnormal growth. You might look at that and go, well, is that a virus or not? So, but you check your records and you know you sprayed dicamba and uh, so you have to admit to yourself that you did it. But again, you see the theme here, growth regulator, uptake, contact. We got ions to do it, salts, you know, burn by contact. The icing salts are taken up preferentially over some nutrients and will we'll build up in the tips and the edge and cause tip and edge dieback, right? Fertility, fertilizers. You know, you think about pH and fertilizers and, and you know, you can either burn plants by using too much. Plants burn if you don't use enough. You know, plants burn if there's an imbalance somewhere. You know, uh, uh, so with nutrition, you're generally looking at uh, a soil test or a tissue test to diagnose that. But recognize that, that there's a color or a growth response related to it. And then you're looking at your predisposition and you're looking at your records uh, to see if you spray. Last thing here, mechanical injuries, breaks, bruises, cracks, punctures. I love this picture. Um, that's a pear. Um, it's one of the reasons why you don't want to plant pears. Um, there's a guy, David Coyle, always posting on Twitter about you know, cut down your pear and we'll give you another tree to replace it or something that way. This was Hurricane Irene. Um, it's, it, it, it literally destroyed the whole plant, right? Broke, you know, snow, winds, whatever, you'll break. Um, you do construction under the root zone. You know, here's a site we went to and they spent all kinds of time building up that, that, that landscape and they killed the trees in the process. You know, you, so you, you can't do that sort of stuff. And then, you know, I don't even know what to say, uh, but, but we used to have a fact sheet at Rutgers called your tree's problem might be you. And uh, it's clearly you in this particular picture, um, but planting problems kind of go along, along here. Listen, I could show you like 90 minutes of these kinds of pictures, um, but, but, but again, recognize that 
that you know it's breaks and bruises and and these are the causes as opposed to a chemical or a, a, a physical thing all right just kind of run really quickly through the end evaluate predisposition right so not only do we want to make decisions about the symptoms that we see biotic versus abiotic you know chemical physical mechanical fungus bacteria virus sucking versus chewing you know we're looking at the symptoms but we also want to think about the circumstances around it right weather site and the management program so analyze the site right and that might just that might mean taking a soil test that might be looking at exposure or drainage or air movement, you know, you have to take some time. And, and, uh, and you know, this is, this is a, a, an extreme example. That tree was in the ground for 18 years and it hadn't grown that well. And I kept saying, that's a root problem, that's a root problem. And they stuck that fork in the ground and popped it right out, right? The ground was so compacted and so high clay content and so wet that the roots would never establish it. It just grew in the pile of mulch. Right, and it, the tree stayed alive, and it was it, it was funny because we just plopped it back in to look like nothing happened. But you know, you need to understand that site matters a lot, right, for the outcomes of your plant health. Um, weather is important. This spring in New Jersey, we had a lot of rain, a long, cool, warm spring. Cool, warm is that a contradiction? You know, it was in the it was about forty five degrees from February until May. And it was raining like once a week. And in those conditions, we get a lot of leaf spots, right? You get a warm, dry winter, you get a lot of mites. You got winter damage and snow damage, you get more cankers. So the weather has a cause and effect in a big way. You know, we have disease modeling and we have growing degree days. We have all kinds of stuff. You know, you want to pay attention to that. What's the most likely source? You know, today on Twitter, I posted a disease in, in turf grass called summer patch. You know, it ain't called summer patch for nothing. You know, the weather is right for the pathogen and the plants to fail, right? Management practices, pruning, fertilization, irrigation, cultivation, you know, and this is just my favorite, how much mulch do you need? You know, uh, more clearly is better. So, you know, what did you do? Why did you do it? When did you do it? How did you do it? What equipment did you use? What was the application rate? You know, what was the weather when you did it? All of these are valuable pieces of information that you need to talk to your client or consider when you're making a decision uh, about what caused the death of the plant, right? Sometimes it's a small, seemingly in, insignificant thing that's the key to everything, you know? And, you know, I remember speaking to a client and, and for like 40 minutes, we couldn't figure it out. And then eventually, she said something about the new irrigation system she just put in and I realized she was watering every day and she just watered her plants into oblivion. Right. So, so again, you need, you need, you know, you kind of have to get to that uh, in order to make the best decisions. Now, the last couple of steps here, you know, identify the sign, you know, if you do the symptom evaluation appropriately, you're going to come to a target. Right, and there's a lot of sophisticated ways of identifying the pathogen off that target. You know, for most of us as a first detector, you know, you're looking at a hand lens and you're looking about a little, looking a little bit closer. You know, and maybe seeing the mites is good enough, right? Maybe seeing the small little black dots on the on the twig is good enough to solve the problem, because then you can go, this is a fungal canker on this branch and we got to cut the branch off to solve the problem right maybe you need a little bit more sophistication because it's a commercial interest or there's economics involved or it's an important plant or you think you might have a keep a uh, 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 an invasive or something one of the one of the problems that we're going to talk about in some of these other lectures and so if that's the case you know get some help right and and it, it's easy to find people like me Right. If you go to the first detectors website, you know, and you click through contact the diagnostician, you put in your state and you're going to find one of my colleagues that can help you identify the pathogen or help you work through all the circumstances around the plant plant health problem and, and get to the most accurate and timely decision uh, in order to solve your plant problem. Um, so again, there's a lot of people out there to help you. Um, but, you know, remember while we synthesize the information. You know, a person like me has a little bit more sophisticated testing, 
and, and tools to identify the signs. But I still have to go through all the steps of, of, of uh, evaluating the host and all of its symptoms and considering all the predispositions and all the circumstances before I can get there and pick the target and pick the right test, right? So, you know, you ever see the show House? Like I'm House, right? You know, everybody's going, I think it's this, I think it's this, I think it's this. And I go, do this test, right? Do this test. And, and, and you guys got to do, I think it's this, I think it's this, I think it's this. And then go, this is what we think the problem is, right? And, and the, the difference between us is I just have a higher level of confidence because I have a higher level of sophistication in the testing and the identification of the sign, you know? But we're still doing the same process and we're still going to get to the same answer, you know, if we do it right. And with that, I, I well, I didn't. I almost made it. Um, is there any questions? Yeah, yeah. you almost made it. Um, <laughs> if we were doing it for an hour, so um, yeah. I didn't interrupt you because I love the talk. I appreciate it every time. Um, does anybody have any questions? Now is the time. I know we're a little bit over on our time. That's typical for me. I'm sorry. It is. Um, it's actually the fastest I've ever seen him give this talk. So I have a couple of questions. Let's see. One thing that I was curious about, Rich, was, um, let's start off with an easy one. Like, well, first of all, I want you to just clarify for our speakers, um, more mulch is not better. That was sarcasm. Right. No, 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 less mulch. Less I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a two inch mulch guy, not a, not a 10 inch mulch guy. Um, but definitely it's, not up around the no pull it away from the tree you know you want to have a little bit of space there um, we're using mulch to maintain soil moisture and maybe prevent a little bit of soil erosion um, it's not it, you know everybody wants it as an aesthetic you know they, they, they want it to look good but it's really a function of plant health um, so less is more with mulch so uh, another easy question, um, what is the most interesting sample you've seen in the lab this year? Uh, I, it's question. a golf course thing that happened yesterday. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it's, it, it, so I, the golf course superintendent called me and, there, and he sent me a picture of a dead spot. And uh, he says, we can't figure this out. And they have what's called a TDR. It's a, it's a soil moisture meter that works on electrical conductivity. And the guy stuck uh, the conductivity meter in good grass and it said 22% moisture. And then he stuck the conductivity meter in the dead spot and uh, it blew the machine up. It was like 127%. And so that's clearly wrong. He's like, what happened to my machine? And, uh, uh, I, I was thinking about it a little bit. I was like, what will mess up a conductivity meter? And uh, uh, I, 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 I'm like, well, what did you spill? Did somebody spill some fertilizer or something? And uh, his assistant was listening to the conversation and screamed out, fox piss. And uh, so it was urine from a fox that had peed on the, on the putting green. And so uh, that was a first for me. <laughs> okay. You know, it's funny that my husband just asked about this because we get that a lot in the New York lab and he never has heard that before. So that's interesting. I'm going to tell him that, that you said that. We do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, can you see the question box, Rich? Uh, yeah, what, let's see. I got a, what is your opinion of using rock for mulch? Um, I'm not a big fan of it. I don't like it. Uh, I don't like the aesthetic, I'll tell you that. But I also don't like it because it, it's a potential heat sink. There's two things, like it'll heat up, right? And then you'll get reflected light off it. So you may have burns. If you have something succulent like a boxwood, that reflected light will, will, could burn tissue. So I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, and then how do you break down viral ID for testing using serological methods, right? So, so that, that's, that's a good question. Um, we go back to plant associations. I mean, we look, we, we look at the symptoms and we, 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 we decide it's a virus and, and then we uh, uh, look to see what, what viruses get on that particular plant. 
and then it's a kind of a I, I, want, I don't want to call it a crapshoot. It's an educated guess, but uh, uh, I keep certain virus test kits in the lab because we see the same problems over and over, like in patients with carotid spot, tobacco mosaic, uh, 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 and and so we just we we seriously sometimes just randomly test test stuff, you know, unless we know, for instance, that we had we had a bunch of blueberry scorch samples. You know, it's likely the key pest in blueberry, and we didn't have the testing protocol here, so I use an outside company. I just send the stuff to the outside company, but uh, but but again, it's it's like, well, this is a virus, and this is what it might be, and then what do we have in the lab that we can we can randomly use, and then and then will the client pay for something more exhaustive, like a screen of some sort? So uh, hopefully that's a good uh, good answer. Um, TRV, uh, we do not. I mean, I I'll tell you, I use I use uh, 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 Agdia a lot. We're good friends with the testing people there, largely because it's more cost effective for some of the stuff that I don't get a huge amount of symptoms in for. You know, uh, tobacco rattle is what I'm assuming. Uh, uh, and so so. So that's, that's the other thing with these serological methods, you can get these test kits in, they don't last that long, right? So uh, if I don't use them, I've, I've wasted money. And, and uh, so, so we will, will work with the, with the, with the uh, uh, outside tech, with the company the idea that makes them, I use them for virus uh, most of the time, put it that way. There's other, other labs we might work with, but, and you know, here's another, here's another answer. Uh, uh, there's other labs that specialize in stuff, right? So, so here, here's the thing that, that happens for me. We, we, Rutgers is a, is a turf grass breeding institution. And so our laboratory specializes in golf turf. You know, I've trained nearly 3000 golf course superintendents. So people come to us with golf, golf turf. You know, if you have a, a, a you know, we get a rose rosette you know, the virus in roses and the folks at Oklahoma State are specialized in that. They have the testing protocols. So we just send all of our rose rosette to them. You know, so if you have a specific problem, shopping the labs a little bit, you know, uh, 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 is something that might help you too. How's that? That's good. Is that too much? <laughs> no. Can you just make a comment about, um, I can't recall if you talked about it at all in your program, um, about disease resistant plants. Yeah, I, I, I sort of, I skipped that. Disease resistance, right? Genetic modifications of, of all sorts. You know, what we're trying to do th with many different techniques is our select plants, you know, that tolerate the attack somehow. And uh, uh, that genetic set point is an important thing, I think, for everybody. When you are picking plants for your landscape or your garden or farm or whatever, is to understand what pest problems you have and pick plants that have a genetic advantage to fight back, right? That is the single most effective, most cost effective, cheapest way of dealing with plant problems, right, is to get the right plant. Right, and, and so uh, you want to spend a little more, spend the save down the road. So if, you're, if you have a, a scab resistant crab apple or something, you know, that, that's saving you maybe eight sprays during the summer to have the same outcome at the end of the year from a tree. So, so, so resistance is a really important thing. Now, the other thing you want to recognize about resistance is it's not absolute. Not all resistance is created equal. I've seen resistant plants dead from the disease they're resistant to, right? So, so you know, uh, uh, if, if the plant don't get it, it don't get it. That's immunity. That's something else. But what, what, with this resistance here, and, and, and the example I usually use is a, is, a, is a putting green grass called L93. It's dollar spot resistant, right? And so that's an important thing for a golf course. But it looks really good on our turf grass farm mowed at five thirty seconds of an inch. If you mow it at a tenth of an inch, you know, if you if you get down, you know, uh, 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 you know, I have golf courses that mow at 0.08. and uh, you know, uh, 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 you don't have enough surface area for photosynthesis from leaf tissue. 
it's dumb to water putting greens because you want them hard so the plants are drought stressing. You don't want to fertilize and get more top growth because that's that messes up the golf game. So that resistance sort of disappears in the way we manage the plant. The plants are so stressed, the genetic advantage doesn't hold up. You know, so 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 you know, even a resistant plant can become diseased if it's predisposed by environmental conditions beyond its control. And, and, and so again, resistance is important, but not an absolute panacea for disease, disease prevention. That's what I was fishing for, thank you. I bought some disease resistant plants for my garden and they are insect resistant or something and they are not that. So I don't know what's happening there. Um, I have one last question and then if there are no others, I'll set you free and everybody else. But I'm curious, um, and I'm not a plant pathologist, so I don't know if this makes sense or not, but um, for bacterial symptoms, they're water soaked. D can those ever change if the weather conditions change? Like, will they become dried out and look like a fungal yeah. thing later? Yes, that's, that's a great question. You know, if the weather changes and it dries out, you know the the progression of the of the symptom will stop it, and it will dry it'll look dried out you know it'll still be angular and if it wets again it'll start back up right and you rarely see that with a with a fungal leaf spot you know you'll it, it makes the side it makes the spot and that's it you know you, you so hopefully that's helpful i think it makes it harder um possibly but I was when, curious if that happened. Yeah, I think it does. And I, I tell you, I tell you what, stick it in a plastic bag. And mm -hmm. if it's a fungus, it's likely to make a fruiting body. And if it's a bacteria, it'll start turning, it'll turn back on and it'll rot, it turn it into a slimy mess. So before we wrap up, is there any one last thing that you want to share with our participants if they have a plant problem? Like what's one thing that they can try to remember from this talk to like do first? Uh, know Just your plant the whole talk again yeah know your plant I, I i really think that's the mo out of all the messages i i send you know plant plant associations are huge so if you understand your plants and what's supposed to go right you'll be able to recognize the deviation from normal and 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 you know once once you understand that you'll be you'll be on your way to getting the right answer of concerning your plant problem Great. Well, I don't see any other questions. Let's see, I lost my questions. Terry was raising her hand, but I'm not sure um, if she wants to put, Terry, if you have a question, if you want to put it, there are a couple people raising their hands. I don't know if you want to just put your question in the chat box or um, the question box. Um, that would be great. All right, well, I'm gonna to start to wrap up. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, Rich, so much. This was a great talk. I always enjoy it whenever I ask you, you know, to participate in something like this. It's, it's wonderful. I learn something every time. Um, we have some, you know, Rich made mention to it in his talk a couple of times. Uh, the rest of our presentations are going to feature specific um, insects or pathogens that are, you know, first detector target pests. So be sure to check them out. We've got a great lineup of speakers um, for the rest of the series. So with that, um, thank everybody for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. Rich, do you have any parting words? Um, no, uh, uh, well, your list, list of speakers coming up are really good. Um, so sign into the, to the rest of the, the programs. I know several of them personally and, and you're in for a treat. Um, I'm sure they'll appreciate that endorsement. So thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Right. Thanks for patience with me. See you. Take care.